welcome to this evening's discussion on institutional religious objections. My name is Ian Bushfield, and I am the Executive Director of the BC Humanist Association. Before we begin, I do want to acknowledge that I'm coming to you from the traditional ancestral and unceded territories of the Coquitlam peoples, the Coquitlam First Nation. As we talk tonight about the history of why religious hospitals are able to refuse to provide reproductive and end-of-life care in BC, I want us to remember the impact that these hospitals, which came hand in hand with colonialism and missionaries, have had on Indigenous communities across these lands. Well, in many cases, they did and continue to provide aid and relief and health care. They were also necessary due to the spread of communicable diseases that came with colonization. Further, many of these hospitals, both religious and secular, perpetuated racist attitudes that continue to this day and deny many people health care. We still have a long way to go to ensure everyone has equal access to health care. I should also take this opportunity to say we're only able to offer programming like this. Thank to our generous members and supporters. We're entirely funded by individuals like you who are able to attend tonight. So please consider joining the association if you haven't or donate at bchumanist.ca slash join. So without further ado, let's talk about healthcare in British Columbia. I'm going to talk a bit about the history of religious hospitals in BC first and how we ended up in a situation where some publicly funded hospitals are able to refuse to permit uh, healthcare services in BC. And then I'll turn it over to our special guest, Helen Long of Dying with Dignity Canada, to provide some national context and more ways you can get involved in the efforts to change the status quo. In British Columbia, the first hospitals were shaped by a context of colonization, urbanization, and population change. This was written by Helen Vandenberg and Geertje uh, Boschma in their 2020 paper, The Evolution of Early Hospitals in British Columbia, which was published in 2020 in BC Studies. I'll include a link to all my references on our website once we've published this recording, but this is a fantastic paper that I'm going to refer to for the first part of this talk, and it's a much longer paper. Prior to the arrival of the early colonists and settlers from Europe, there obviously existed from time immemorial indigenous healers who provided healthcare both to their own people and later to the first Europeans to arrive in these lands. The first colonists and settlers were also served by passing physicians and other Western healthcare professionals who began to settle in the province. It wasn't until the 1850s and 60s that the first hospitals in BC were actually constructed. A lot of these I found were actually secular, or at least non-denominational, and came with the title Royal Hospital of Victoria and so forth, and that recognized the support they received from the British government. The first religious hospitals in the province was opened in Victoria. It was St. Joseph's Catholic Hospital, which was built in 1876 by the Nursing Sisters of St. Anne. Throughout the 1870s and 1880s, Catholic hospitals such as St. Mary's in New Westminster and St. Luke's Home in Vancouver continue to be built alongside a growing number of similar secular non-denominational facilities, including the Vancouver City Hospital, which was originally built by the Canadian Pacific Railway. Uh, it would later be renamed the Vancouver General Hospital that we all know. According to that paper I mentioned, those early Catholic hospitals were largely funded by Catholic sisterhoods and, quote, set out to pride themselves on accepting any type of patient regardless of condition, age, or race. Royal Columbian and New West, by contrast, didn't accept patients with incurable conditions, nor children, nor the elderly. Protestants as well were building hospitals, notably the Methodists and Presbyterians, which later became the United Church. They established hospitals in more remote regions of the province, such as the coastal areas around Bella Bella. These were often run by missionaries with medical background because of their status. In, and because of their status in remote communities, they were also often appointed to local government roles. So you had missionary physicians acting as the chief medical officer and sometimes uh, in other senior roles. Chinese and Japanese communities also ended up opening their facility own hospitals, often because they faced immense discrimination in these majority white hospitals. When they did open their own facilities, they were often demeaned in the press and were frequently denied similar financial aid as other hospitals. And so there's a dark history there as well, which isn't quite related, but I thought it was worth mentioning when we're talking about the history of hospitals in this province. As we get into the 20th century, more and more people began to talk about the need for a public medical insurance program, one that would protect everyone. St. Joseph's Hospital in Victoria had opened a public insurance program that cost a dollar a month in the, 18, in the late 19th century, and that was open to people of all faiths and races. But there was no overarching policy to cover every British Columbian, particularly those who were unemployed. The first real proposal came in 1935 from Liberal Premier Duff Patello, who passed a Medicare bill 
It was actually pretty deeply unpopular, though, by the medical establishment, and it was never implemented. Some partial social assistance programs started to roll out, but it wasn't until W.A.C. Bennett introduced the B.C. Medical Service Plan in 1965 that every British Columbian would have access to health care. A few years later, B.C. joined Saskatchewan in being the first two provinces to join the federal government's Medicare program in 1968 under Prime Minister Lester B. Pearson, who ironically for this talk, uh, his father was a Methodist minister, and he managed to pass that with the support of Baptist preacher Tommy Douglas. Later, under Pierre Elliott Trudeau in 1969, abortion was partially decriminalized. It was not fully decriminalized until the Supreme Court of Canada's Morgan Toller decision in 1988. And in that in-between period, abortions could only be provided in a hospital with a therapeutic abortion community. And there was no requirement, as far as I could tell in BC, that any hospitals here had to have those. Rather, it was up to each individual hospital to board to decide for itself whether to provide the service or not. And as you can imagine, Catholic hospitals and their moral opposition to abortion undoubtedly didn't provide the service. And so this created obvious disparities in access and led to the creation of the abortion caravan that departed in Vancouver in 1970 and the continued fight up until the Morgenthaler decision in 1988. When that was announced, uh, then Premier Bill van der Zam announced that BC would refuse pro to provide coverage for any abortion that was not sanctioned by a remaining abortion committee. He was widely condemned for this in the press and by feminist groups. And most notably, he was condemned within his own caucus, first and most vociferously by Kim Campbell, the person who would go on to be Canada's only female prime minister. Van der Zam did ultimately back down and committed to funding the procedure, whether or not a committee had approved it. The 1991 election actually featured abortion quite heavily as the BC NDP under Mike Harcourt ran on explicitly expanding access to abortion. They promised to fund clinics uh, and to take away the right of hospital boards to decide whether or not they will provide abortions and to make sure it was available in every hospital in the province. Of, as you undoubtedly know, the BC NDP won in 1991, and they actually began delivering on these promises. In March 1992, the government amended the Hospital Act and designated 33 hospitals that must perform abortions in BC. That's section 24.1 of the Act, if you want to look it up, and it reads, each hospital listed in the schedule of this Act must provide the facilities and services and be operated and maintained as necessary to allow a qualified person to receive abortions services at a hospital. Now, none of those first 33 hospitals that were listed were religious. That list has grown a little bit over the years, and it's about 34 or 35 summer subcategories, um, but there's still no religious hospitals listed on there, so they never forced every hospital to do it. According to the Pro-Choice Action Network of BC's abortion history, they say that in 1993, the Catholic Archbishop Adam Exner said staff at BC's nine Catholic hospitals must forbid abortion, contraception, euthanasia, and sterilization. The chief medical health officer of Vancouver noted that Vancouver General Hospital was the only non-religious hospital for adults in Vancouver at the time. And in many ways, it still is. If you do as well have BC Women's now, um, BC Women's at the time was originally operated by the Salvation Army as Grace Maternity Hospital, and it was operated by the Sally Ann until 1994, when the original Shaughnessy site of that facility was closed and responsibility was transferred to the province and later to the Public Health Service of Agency of BC. The province and the hardcore government would continue to work on this question of abortion in hospitals across BC and ultimately came to develop what became known as the Master Agreement with Denominational Healthcare Facilities Association. And that was signed on March 16, 1995. That agreement states that the province grants the hospitals that are part of the denominational association, which is all the religious ones, the right to, quote, preserve the spiritual nature of the facility. In other words, they can refuse to provide services that would desecrate their consecrated buildings, their holy grounds because I've heard that St. Paul's in downtown Vancouver actually has consecrated religious Catholic land. Today, members of denominational healthcare uh, include Providence Healthcare, who operates St. Paul's in downtown Vancouver, as well as a number of Protestant and Jewish associations that operate long-term care homes. Because of that master agreement, none of these facilities are required to provide abortion, nor are they required to provide medical assistance in dying. This master agreement has resulted in the stories we're all familiar with, the forced transfer of 173 patients for medical assistance in dying between 2019 and 22 across the province, 
and the requirement that people looking to end their pregnancy or even access contraceptives have to go to a willing facility. In 2022, just five of these agencies, Providence, Louise Breyer, Mount St. Mary, St. Michael's, and Menno Hospital were paid over $1.1 billion by the provincial government. Uh, many other long-term care homes also received 50% of their funding from the province, but these agencies uh, aren't static and this history does shift. Notably, Comox Valley's main hospital for over 100 years was St. Joseph's General Hospital, which was founded by the Sisters of St. Joseph's in Toronto. In 2017, a new North Island Hospital was completed and operation of that facility was taken over by the Vancouver Island Health Authority. Today, the Catholic agency St. Joseph's only runs the remaining long-term care facility in the city and the Comox Valley is finally served by a secular hospital. More controversially was the story of the Delta Hospice Society. They operated the Irene Thomas Hospice in Delta and the society's board was taken over by anti-choice religious zealots, frankly. Because of their refusal to allow medically assisted deaths on site in 2021, the province pulled funding from the facility and eventually transferred control to Fraser Health. These two examples offer pass forward for the province as other situations come up, like the redevelopment of St. Paul's Hospital in Vancouver, which is continuing. They are moving the hospital, if you don't know, from its position on Burrard Street to uh, the space behind the uh, terminal on the train terminal over there on Main Street. The province is injecting $1.3 billion of the over two, slightly over $2 billion project. So there's a lot of money at play in these uh, instances, and this represents a lot of long-term care beds as well. For our part on the BC Human Association, we're lobbying the provincial health minister to frankly just tear up the master agreement and just require every publicly funded hospital in the province to provide every legal and publicly funded health procedure that they are able to. We're asking you to write your member of the Legislative Assembly to say as much and we can put a link in the chat to help you do that when I remember to do that. And it will be included in the notes at the end of this as well. Ideally, as humanists and secularists, we'd see the province bring all publicly funded healthcare under secular administration. Institutional objections are just one of the issues that are at play for us here, but it has some of the most material impact on patients and on British Columbians. Now, BC isn't the only province facing this challenge. Religious hospitals have similar histories across the country, and there are actually a couple of provinces where the situation is different, but I'll let our uh, co, our special guests speak to that. So it's my tr pleasure now to turn the screen over to Helen Long, the CEO of Dying with Dignity Canada, and I hope you will all give her a warm welcome. So thanks very much for having me, and I want to acknowledge that I am in the city of Pickering tonight in Ontario, and we are within the treaty and traditional territory of the Mississaugas of Skugog Island First Nation and the Williams Treaty signatories of the Mississauga and Chippewa Nations. Um, so I thought I'd start with just a super brief overview of Diamond Dignity Canada and the work that we do. Uh, for those of you who may not know, we are a national human rights journey. Uh, we're really the national human rights journey committed to improving quality of dying, protecting end of life rights, and helping people in Canada to avoid unwanted suffering. So we do that in four ways. Um, advocacy, so advocating for assisted dying laws that respect the Constitution and the Charter, uh, providing support to people who are navigating end-of-life choice, including specifically made or medical assistance in dying, educating people across Canada uh, about their end-of-life options, and supporting healthcare practitioners who assess and provide for me. So in terms of um, advocacy. Tonight we're talking about institutional re religious obstructions, but we also do quite a lot of work uh, at the federal level where the assisted dying laws are uh, located. So our priority in that space right now uh, is around advance request, which is the ability to put in place a written request for made now uh, before you need it so that uh, once you reach the description in your request and your suffering is intolerable, you can have made at a later date once you've lost capacity. Um, so if that's something that's interesting to you, you can check out our website, dynamicdignity.ca. Um, it, it really, that's a big federal legislative push. Uh, in terms of support, uh, we help people to navigate the process. So anything from um, connecting to the, to the care coordination team in their province or region, to actually connecting them with clinicians, providing resources uh, in their community, or just answering questions around the process. 
um, right now because of the changes to the law around um, made for those with a mental disorder as a sole underlying medical condition. We're getting quite a lot of calls from people who are looking for um, information on that when it becomes eligible next March. And as a result, we're doing a lot of referrals and um, transfers to mental health supports. And with the support of our volunteer chapters across the country, uh, we also provide witnesses for those uh, writing and made requests. Um, education is a huge part of what we do. So everything from sharing information and facts on social media, creating and disseminating resources like advanced care planning kits or patient rights guides, um, webinars, in-person presentations. Our chapters across the country also do a lot of presentation and education work. Um, and we spend a lot of time uh, correcting misinformation in the media. Um, you know, over the last year, there's been an awful lot of, um, you know, what we would call clickbait headlines, uh, and that takes up a lot of our time. All those resources that we have are provided free of charge, so you can also get those from our website uh, if you're interested. So in terms of institutional religious obstruction, so... While we talk a lot and have talked, I think, historically, a lot about what we call a forced transfer, so that situation where someone is in a religious um, healthcare facility, decides they want to have made, it has to be transferred, often, you know, in a lot of pain uh, at a very significant time in their life when they want to be able to talk to and connect to their loved ones, potentially, you know, they're medicated to the point that they are unconscious. I think you're all familiar with the story of Sam O'Neill, uh, which was uh, quite big in BC for, for quite a period of time. While we're talking a lot about that, and that's probably the most grievous of the uh, obstructions, an obstruction can be less than that. So it can be a failure to provide information when it's asked for. If you're in St. Paul's and you decide you'd like to have me and you want to talk about it, um, not providing information is an obstruction. Not allowing an assessment on site, not allowing a clinician to come in and, and do that part of the process. Um, being denied access to be admitted to a hospice or a palliative care facility because you're thinking you might have made. Those are all obstructions. Um, in every province across Canada, not every province and territory, most provinces and territories, this is a problem. So we have a few provinces, Nova Scotia, Quebec uh, in particular, have taken a pretty clear stand. Quebec has uh, more recently just said, no, everyone has to be able to provide MAID. Um, but in all the other provinces and territories, there is, is something different. So uh, Ian talked a little bit about the master agreement in BC, which is the, the main piece um, that you have. And in theory, you know, Minister Dix could just say, okay, forget it. We're serving notice. 365 days, the agreement's over. In other provinces, there are other barriers. And sometimes it's more than one barrier. In Ontario, for example, there's quite a complicated um, number of pieces that come together that form various reasons why obstructions are allowed. So as a result, we kind of have to look at every province or territory differently. So how could you fix the problem? So there's two basic easy, easy ways to fix it. One, the institutions could say, okay, we really are patient-centric. We're really concerned about compassion and patient care, and we're just going to stop the practice. Um, the second is that the province or territories, much like Nova Scotia and Quebec, could require the healthcare facilities to provide aid. We don't think either of those things is going to happen um, voluntarily or anytime soon, so we are currently preparing a legal challenge um, the basis of the challenge is that in Section 2 of the Charter, it speaks about freedom of religion um, for institutions. And, you know, without getting into all the legal details, there's a webinar on our website you can watch if you're interested in more of that. Basically, if an institution is cons cons uh, constituted primarily for religious purposes and its operations accord with those purposes, it could make the case that it is um, able to use conscience rights or claim freedom of religion. In the case of a hospital, though, or a hospice or a palliative care facility, all of those facilities are constituted for healthcare purposes. So the team that we're working with feels quite strongly um, that that would not be upheld by a court and that we would, in fact, be able to eliminate um, that protection through a court challenge. So what we're doing right now, um, I can't go into, you know, a ton of details, 
but a couple of things where you could get involved. We are doing a letter writing campaign, and I know that Ian mentioned uh, BC Humanist also has a campaign. I don't mind whose you use, uh, but send a letter to your MLA. If you can personalize it on our website, for example, you can just click on the letter and personalize it. And that makes a difference. Um, it's much more impactful if the MP feels like they're, or the MLA is hearing directly from an individual. If you have a story, uh, talk about your own story, that's also impactful. So send a letter. Um, if you've experienced or have a loved one who experienced uh, a situation where there was a religious obstruction, uh, feel free to go to our website. At the very bottom, there is a uh, share your story um, tab. We're collecting stories. Obviously, we won't be able to use all of them, but we're collecting stories of any type of obstruction um, so that we can use those and they can form part of the, the case as we move forward. And then finally, if you want to keep up to date, um, you can sign up for updates on our website. So that's kind of the, I mean, guess the Coles Notes version of where we are and what we're doing. Um, I expect as things proceed, we will have more information to share and we'll be looking to engage people in uh, other ways. Um, but for now, that's really the basis of what we're, we're doing in our work in that, that space. Thank you so much, Helen. I'm glad to hear all of that. That's a lot of fantastic information. 